Welcome to today's webinar, Reflections on 2021 and Aspirations for 2022 from Digital Learning Leaders and Learners. I'm Megan Raymond. I hope that many of you are joining us for the first time or for the hundredth time. We really like these beginning of the year webinars because it's a great time to kind of reset our intentions for the year and really pat ourselves on the back for 2020 plus plus. So here we are in 2022 and hopefully it's going to be a little different and better year for all. As we go through the conversation today, please enter your questions into the question box and we'll make sure to get those. And we hope to have a very active discussion in chat, but we don't wanna lose your questions. So do put it into the Q&A please. Kim will share the slides and this is being recorded. So we'll share the link out with you later next week. If you wanna follow along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCET webcast. Just another reminder, put your Q, your Q and A in the Q and A so that we can keep track of that. We have a wonderful moderator today, a longtime friend of WCET and a familiar face to many of you in education. She's been doing this for a, a little more than 25 years. We won't say exactly how many years. Carrie O'Donnell, she's the founder and CEO of O'Donnell Learn. Welcome, Carrie. Oops, had to unmute myself. Thank you, Megan. Happy to be facilitating the conversation today. Um, and I want to encourage everybody as um, we speak to feel free to make comments. I mean, the great thing about this is that we have a lot of um, people that are as expert as anyone here um, uh, at, at um, what we're talking about and what's happening in education. So please feel free to play along and chat and we'll try to bring your um, your, your comments to the forefront, and then put your questions in Q&A so that we can make sure that we catch them. So let's introduce the panel. I'd like to have everybody introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with uh, John Holcroft. Hi there, thank you, Carrie. Uh, John Holcroft here. Uh, I am the Associate Vice President of BibliU. Uh, the company's based in London, although about half of us live here in the United States. I live in Seattle, Washington. I've been a part of uh, educational technology companies for uh, a decade or two, and I feel very flattered to be able to join and learn from the community today. So thank you for inviting me. Great. Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer Seymour. I serve as Vice President of General Education and Applied Technologies at WSU Tech in Wichita, Kansas. I saw someone mentioned in the chat, it's cold in Texas. I'm sorry that some of our air is leaking farther south. It's 14 degrees here today. Um, so I have the pleasure of serving alongside our academics in general education, applied technologies, uh, culinary, which is a fun area, as well as our um, applied learning and career services teams. I'm happy to be here and have a conversation with everyone. Awesome. Kelvin. Hi, everybody. Kelvin Thompson uh, from the University of Central Florida, UCF, where I serve as executive director for the Center for Distributed Learning, and uh, from where I co-host uh, TopCast, the Teaching Online podcast. <laughs> Been in education for 29 years. I just did the math. I'm like, oh my gosh, how'd, how'd that happen? And it is not 14 degrees here. I'm looking outside and it's 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry. Nice. Uh, I hope you're drinking a little cup of, a cup of good coffee. I did earlier, I did earlier. Try to limit myself, try to limit myself. <laughs> Okay, um, and we have Jessica. Hey everyone, I'm Jessica Roland Williams, Director of Every Learner Everywhere. And Every Learner is a network of organizations. We have 12 partners, including WCET. And our work is focused at the intersection of digital learning, evidence-based teaching, and equity and racial justice. So good to be here with you all. Awesome. And last but totally not least, Kiara. Hello everyone, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Kiara Williams. I am a recent graduate of Georgia State University in Atlanta. Um, I've worn many hats in my, my years on this earth, but right now I do serve as the education outreach coordinator for 3D Girls Incorporated. We do a lot of education and empowerment and I will be here giving a lot of good insight on the perspective of a student um, being a recent graduate. So I'm very excited and very happy to speak with you all. Great. Thank you all. Okay, well, I'll open this up. Uh, many of us thought that we would be emerging in early 2022 out of the pandemic crisis and into 
into the new normal, right? Well, that isn't happening with Omicron. We're getting another set of crisis and disruption this year. And, um, and we're just gonna have to deal with this, right? But faculty, students, and academic support teams are already burnt out. They, they're anxious and frankly, in a constant state of anxiety. So they've had to change the way that learning is delivered and haven't had time to sit back and think about how to make this experience more successful for all of the players. So I think that's what we're going to explore today. We're gonna to look at the future world. We know it's gonna be blended, some amalgamation, some disruption. Sometimes we'll be face-to-face -face and then we'll find ourselves in a virtual environment. And what we wanna do is talk about what we can do to deliver, to deliver a more humanized and equitable experience for all in this world. And particularly focusing on minoritized populations, on affordability, and access to all the resources that you need to get to as a learner to be successful. So I'm gonna start, we're gonna ask a bunch of questions and have everybody talk. And I, again, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll say it again, please feel free to contribute in chat. This, we want this to be a, an interactive webinar. We wanna hear from you. So um, I'm thinking about the blended world of 2022. What does the ideal learning experience look like? And how does it differ from experiences of the past? Calvin, I'd love to have you kick us off. Sure, thanks. Um, I think that the ideal learning experience in a word or a hyphenated two words is student-centered. And student-centered takes intentionality and design. And in my experience, many faculty attempt to replicate courses that they've experienced in the past as learners because they've not had the opportunity for more explicit preparation and course design and teaching and nuanced thoughts. Consider all the, the various aspects, everything from whether it's uh, diversity, equity and inclusivity or accessibility, universal design programming, whatever. And so faculty professional development is key to a more student-centered uh, learning experience and to overcoming one's own limitations. We all have our our, our limitations in our, in our thinking. So if possible, collaborative design support from other professionals is a great benefit. Uh, if not, just building, brokering relationships with trusted faculty colleagues is a good start. But faculty preparation and team-based, if possible, intentional design are key regardless of modality. We just kind of tend to deploy those things more in online settings, but we don't need to be limited to that. You know, Calvin, that's really great. And one of the things, we did a survey of faculty, 500 faculty last year, and we asked them about how they deliver their um, courses and when they're in a virtual environment. And 50% of them said they mirror what they do in the face-to-face -face classroom. So that's not an intentional design. And, um, and Kara, I see you shaking your head. That's not really great for the students. So, um, um, so anyway, we'll bring in, so Kara, from the viewpoint of the student, tell us about what the ideal experience looks like for you. Well, um, honestly, one thing that is probably universal sentiment is that humans tend to be creatures of habit. We do things and then we keep doing them because they work until a couple of years ago when all that went to the air and things that have worked are suddenly not working and they will continue to just not be ideal. So honestly, when I think of the ideal learning experience, of course, I'm going to talk about things like it being flexible and accessible, because those are two major themes. Um, in the past, it's been in person, you know, we had that standard traditional way of learning, you show up to class, you sit down with your books. Um, and in today's world, it's really changed. As far as flexibility goes, ideally, we want the different modalities that we'll probably speak of, um, you know, in this conversation. We have to pay to take quizzes and do homeworks for some classes, and we have to pay for books and for access codes. And in ideal learning experience, students don't want to jump through those hoops or have to dish out that money to be able to do something like do homework or take a quiz. So it's like that conversation, it, it's just an endless cycle. And with COVID, a lot of people losing jobs and not being able to work, 
conversations were how are we going to continue doing that how are me like how am i as a student going to why should i have to pay to do my homework and also pay to be in this class and i don't know flexibility and accessibility is always going to be those main themes that we cannot stop talking about that leads really beautifully into Jennifer, who I know you've been focusing on access and affordability. So talk to us about it. Absolutely. And before I jump into that, I want to add that, you know, Kiara was talking about we're creatures of habit and we do something because it works. I would argue that sometimes we're creatures of habit and we keep doing things even if it isn't working. <laughs> so we've been at WSU Tech looking for ways to make it easier for our faculty to try something different, um, but not have it be something that is so different for them that it's too hard to make that change. So we've partnered with our friends at BibliU um, who are helping us with their platform to provide our students with their textbooks electronically. And this is important to us for a lot of different reasons, most of them centering around equity and access. So um, by having this platform and the books automatically being available to the students within their LMS, we're a Blackboard school, uh, it's there for them on the very first day of class. So you don't have that struggle as a faculty member of two, three weeks into the classroom, your students still don't have the course materials that they need to be successful in your course. Um, it's also not all of these different access codes that Kiara was um, referring to there. You don't have to worry about that. It's all right there, ready for you. Um, it is currently we're using some of our HERF funds to provide this to our students at no additional charge. But as we continue with this program, um, it will be wrapped into tuition and fees. So it's not an additional fee for our students. It's not, I paid my tuition, now I'm going to the bookstore and I've got to come up with another $750 for these textbooks. And we also love that uh, BibliU provides these resources in a format that's searchable. It will read to them. It will change the text size or font color so that if you have some sort of a disability that you learn differently, this is going to work with you to make that as easy for you as possible. Great, great. So John, you're sitting at BibliU right now, but you've had a lot of different roles in education technology and education content. And um, I think that we'd we, we've heard great things about what you're doing at BibliU now. What, from your perspective, uh, your, uh, what do you think the ideal looks like? And what are you seeing that's really most successful? Yeah. Um... Thanks for the question, Carrie. Uh, I, I would say um, uh, all of what Jennifer said, thank you for that. And, and I think uh, she has the credibility to talk about what, what it's like uh, in implementing some of these solutions. But I, I also think some of the other partners that we've worked with, they're, they're taking this period of uncertainty and unprecedented challenges. I mean, who on this call thought two years ago that some of us would be responsible, uh, you and your institutional uh, leadership roles to figure out on-site uh, uh, COVID issues uh, and, and how you deal with that. And, but one of the things it's done is also create opportunities. Uh, one of the schools that we work with, um, uh, Jackson College uh, in Michigan actually decided that um, their relationship uh, with their bookstore, they should look at differently and, and ask if, if we don't have students on campus, where is the value of having books shipped to a bookstore and, and made available that way. So they, they've worked with us and, and kind of, uh, the bookstore still exists for retail and, and other things. And I think that will always exist. Uh, but, but they're saying, how do we maybe go all digital more quickly as an opportunity, not as a burden? And like Kiera said, to create uh, flexibility and accessibility for students to have access all the time uh, and those that can't get to campus for some of these reasons. And then what Jackson is doing is some of those funds with the bookstore uh, that were associated with the bookstore, they're now pouring back into student services, hiring more student success coaches, uh, more support for faculty, and, and, and hopefully BibliU has been one of the people that's helped with them with that. So I, I think um, as I've observed when I knock on doors and, and get to meet with campuses, there are challenges, but there are some opportunities like there as well that, that I think people um, are appreciating and, and navigating through. Right. 
So Heather McCullough from UNC Charlotte says this is ti very timely. Your um, this whole concept of moving um, some of the some of the cost transparency, moving things away from back into the registration, for example, um, and um, so that's something I see a lot of schools looking at. I also. Um, uh, Shelly, um, you were, you commented, you're from, I think you're at Cal State Fullerton, um, we've met before, but you commented about this, this is an advocating for open education resources, and um, we worked a lot with OER in our company, and in building new, bringing new um, content solutions to schools, and I'm just going to circle right back around to where Calvin started, and say that what really is required for these types of solutions is really strong faculty development, because a lot of times faculty get these these um, new opportunities and they don't quite know what to do with them. So, uh, just a comment. Okay, um, next question. So, if we assume that the workplace of the future is more fluid and blended, and requires workers to have an ever evolving set of skills and knowledge. Uh, and we know that a, most of our students are entering in higher education right now, either to reskill, upskill, or to prepare themselves for the workforce. Um, and that is, a, a, that is the reality of today. Um, what can we do to ensure that our students are, are in, that your institutions or that institutions are preparing their students for this new world of work? So to kick that off, um, I, I'd like to start with Kiara. What do you think? You just got out of college recently. <laughs> well, you know, as far as preparing students to be successful in this new world, whatever new normal we are approaching, um, I think the one thing that will come to mind immediately will be relevant work experience, work-based learning, because when we apply for jobs, they want people with experience. I mean, that, that's just a fact. We want people that ha have done the job, have experience doing the job. So as a university, as a college and institution, are we giving those type of opportunities to our students? Do they know about these opportunities? You know, how can we help them go about, you know, getting these opportunities? So relevant work experience, a lot of work-based learning, um, even then moving into an increasing, increasingly digitalized world, maybe classes and courses or just ways to teach students how to be successful on digital platforms. That is a huge one. I know a lot of professors that we like we had to sit and be patient because grace and patience also was a major theme, in, you know, emerging out of COVID. We had to learn how to navigate certain systems that we've never really had to navigate before being in person primarily. So it's just a lot of skills, a lot of, a lot of digital skills, I think that we could benefit from. Um, a lot of relevant work experience, you know, experience in fields that people want to, you know, go for. That will be probably what comes to mind for me as a student. Great, great. Um, well, Jessica, from the perspective of um, leading a network of that uh, of institutions that are really focused on helping minoritized populations be successful, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think this is an awesome opportunity for organizations to also provide opportunities for students. Um, one thing that we've done within our own organization is launch a student fellows program where we actually invite students into our work. Um, and we, and Kiara is actually, was one of our, she's one of our student fellow alumni, um, and we have many others, and um, this is an important, this is important for us for a number of reasons, you know, I think a lot of times we, we solve for students, right, but we don't solve with students, and that's, that's an important shift that we've had to make within our network. Um, we also realized through that fellows program that there are a lot of soft skills that we have opportunities to teach fellows, things like how to set up your LinkedIn page, right, or how to translate the classroom work that you've done into, you know, what would be considered work experience. And, um, you know, I think there are a lot of things that, that we just take for granted that students should know that they don't know. And I think that organizations like my network and organizations within my network have the opportunities to really, you know, support students in tangible ways. Um, but it just really means taking that extra step of bringing students in our work and um, providing that mentorship and guidance. Excellent. 
Excellent. And this kind of circles back. I was just looking at the chat um, on, uh, and um, because I think Megan asked, um, what do you think a panelist is the ideal learning experience? And a lot of people circled back to the whole idea of being able to be successful in any modality. And I think that that kind of lends itself really well to the, if you can do that in the lear, um, in our learning experience and you can help to prepare students to be successful in, in any modality. So awesome. Um, so Jennifer, you know, from your perspective leading, um, you know, a lot of applied and technical education, um, do you have any comments on that? You know, we really um, pride ourselves on the on being a microcosm of our economy here in Wichita, and we work very closely with all of our local employers to find out not only what are their current needs, but what are they forecasting their needs are going to be in the future, so that we can walk along that journey with them and help them prepare their workforce. Uh, we're very focused on integrating applied learning into as much as many of our programs as possible and getting our students actually in industry as soon as they can in their academic journey so that while they're in our classrooms, they're also on a manufacturing floor or on a flight line. You know, they're working hand in hand with mentors in the industry to learn not just book knowledge, but that practical knowledge that they're going to need to be able to apply to be successful in their career. Um, it gives them someone they can talk to. What have you done to be successful in your career? What are the next steps that I should be considering in order to move up in this career? Or what are things I didn't think were possible? When I thought I wanted to be in aviation, I had a very narrow view of what that is. But once I had experience in, you know, actually in a manufacturing plant, I realized there were so many other things that were out there. Um, I've, I should clarify, I'm not in aviation, but students have said these things to me. They didn't know what other jobs were available to them because they just had this very narrow view. So educating our students on, on all of these different opportunities by getting them in and, and plugged in as soon as possible. So I'm gonna ask this just kind of a general question and I'd like to ask this to um, the, the universe here. Um, I know Luke Downs said opportunities for durable skills practice and attainment is equity work, couldn't agree more. And, um, but I would love you to kind of talk about what you've seen, like what are some really good types of initiatives, programs, or activities that can um, that that are out there that can actually um, give students the opportunity to practice and prepare. Um, and, and, and so any anyone, I'm going to leave this open to the to the universe here. Ah, nobody's answering. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to you, Jess. I'm going to go back to you, Jennifer. Like, um, what are you guys, what are some of the programs you have at your school? <laughs> yeah, so we have lots of different applied learning opportunities, whether it's what you might think of as a traditional internship. Um, or what we what we like to develop, earn and learns. So you are going to school and lockstep with an employer. They are paying you a living wage so that you, while you are learning alongside um, their mentors and while you're in class, you're you're making money too, right? Because so many of our students can't afford to work for free. And honestly, as an employer, you shouldn't expect them to. The work they're doing for you is valuable to you and you should be compensating them fairly for that. Um, but it allows them to learn and not worry about how am I going to feed my family? How am I gonna pay for daycare for my kiddos while I'm at school or at work? They're being compensated fairly for the work that they're doing while they are learning. And then they see that career path, they see that progression and they can see themselves earning and learning throughout their lifetime. And for so many students, they don't see that opportunity. No one has taken them by the hand and said, you can do this. And let me show you what you're capable of if you take these steps. And I'm gonna be here with you to help guide you along the way until you can start taking these steps on your own. Great, 
great, great. Um, I'm gonna come to some of the things in chat in a moment, but I did wanna ask um, Jessica, you talked a little bit about your student fellowship program. Are there other in, um, programs that you've seen at some of the schools in your network that you think are most, um, you know, one of the things I think about is scale. Like I think it, there's always these programs, but it's like a onesie, right? And are there things that you've seen um, or institutions you've seen that have done a really good job at scaling this? Yeah, that's a good question. I think a lot of, unfortunately, um, there's been a challenge recently with the with COVID, right? Um, and so one thing that we're hearing from students is that they're having a hard time finding internships because there aren't a lot of organizations and companies that are willing to do virtual internships for students or remote internships for students. And so um, that's been a huge hindrance for, for people. And uh, I think um, oftentimes people are, are being privileged um, who are, you know, able to travel um, even in during COVID, um, and we know that, you know, a lot of marginalized students just maybe aren't willing to take the risk or have to work or have to do other things. And so um, they're, you know, they're not able to take advantage of the opportunities and there are a lot fewer opportunities, right? And I think that's an important thing to note because that's gonna play out um, over time um, into the workforce, right? And what opportunities are available if there are groups of students who aren't able to get that experience that you talked about, Jennifer, you know? Um, then is that going to ultimately put them at a disadvantage when they're ready to graduate and they haven't had those internships, they haven't had those, you know, um, <clears throat> those opportunities. Um, that being said, um, you know, things come across my newsfeed and LinkedIn and email all the time. Um, so one that I'm excited about that I just learned about recently is a partnership between um, HBCUs and the NBA. Um, so that's one for folks to look out for if you know of any juniors and seniors who are um, at H attending HBCUs right now. Um, the NBA is looking for interns and looking to hire a number of interns um, this summer. So if I find the link, I'll stick it in the chat. But that's that's a really cool one that's kind of on the you know circuit right now. That's really great. We were talking, I had I was in a conversation earlier this morning with um, uh, associate provost at Cal State Dominguez Hills, Ken O'Donnell, about high impact practices. And um, one of his uh, ideas for scaling high impact practices, and by the way, high impact practices, internships, um, you, you know, uh, re student research, the things that give students the skills, the students fellowship programs, right? One thing he said is um, that the, a really important thing to keep in mind is piggybacking on initiatives that are already at the institution and people that already have excitement about whatever their initiative is and, and tagging on these kinds of programs onto them. And I thought that was a very good, really good idea, you know, for scaling, because I think one of the things people really struggle with is scale. So I want to come back to the chat here. And um, the question we all want to know, Kira, is was Pounce as effective as promoted? And I just want you to know that I may be dumb, but I have no idea what Pounce is. So could you tell us what it is first? <laughs> um, Pounce is a, a gem to the Georgia State University community. Um, very much known for bringing luck and blessings to the student body. Um, and every time you rub his nose, I think a bit more luck is transferred into the system. Um, I rubbed his nose a couple times just to see what would happen. And I think I think life turned out pretty pro pretty promising. So, so you're in the positive data point. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. On on the graph, I am the the success story that comes from the data analyzation. I think they might be referring to the chat bot here. Do you remember the Pounce chat bot? The text. Oh, chat the bot chat bot. bot? Oh, that was hilarious when that was released. Oh my! Any any chat bot any. The, the world is crazy. Technology is crazy, but oh my gosh. I think, I think the mascot is not nearly as, um, you know, the chatbot is not nearly as popular as the mascot. I will say that, um, you know, a crowd favorite, if you must. <laughs> okay, so Heather McCullough said um, that she told us a little bit about her learning design and technology program, which has a capstone program. Um, where the students design training solution and then the center of teaching and learning has used them to great effect. That's a perfect example, Heather, of 
taking an initiative that's already in place and designing high impact student practices to prepare students and get them practicing. Um, simple as shadowing in different fields, John um, Wilmshare says. Um, and yeah, John, John Holcraft, you know, talk to us a little bit. Um, I think, uh, you know, some of the um, people here probably have done some stackable credentials and badging programs, but tell us what you've seen that have really, you've found to be effective at Grand Canyon, Phoenix, or WSU Tech. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and uh, Jennifer might have even more intimate knowledge of the aviation program, but I had a conversation with the dean there uh, who talked about, you know, how uh, they're, they're very, very well tuned to the <clears throat> aviation industry, obviously, and they, they really want to create the, the content curriculum and training that the industry requires and having these stackable degrees and confirming that students are uh, accessing the content, doing the simulations, and, and showing the badging as well. Um, uh, I was speaking to the senior provost at University of Phoenix, uh, who we work with as well. And uh, they are extremely focused with uh, their industry partners, whether it's healthcare, uh, automotive, uh, other areas as well, the computer information technology. And uh, they are uh, working with us around some of the content, but also other partners out there that um, are wanting to see, you know, can a student graduate at Phoenix and if it has three badges in CIT and two in another area, how do we, how do we establish the value of that? And I, I think that there's some interesting things going on that probably a lot of the audience is, is working on beyond my knowledge as well. So just some observations of some of the partners that I work with. Yeah, go Jet, please. I was gonna say, we like to think of stackable credentials as a highway with multiple on and off ramps. So um, if you need to jump off for a little while, you have this credential and you can go do these things with it and be successful. And when you're ready to jump back on the education highway, we're here waiting for you. And we've got that next level of credential um, that you can start working toward. That's excellent. Excellent. So Judith said, you're working to help our member colleges explore um, 3D SIM trainings for career and technical education program. You know, it's interesting. O'Donnell does a lot of building content. We, we, I mean, we, we're a design, we have a whole design team, hundreds of designers, and they work with um, institutions and organizations. And one of the things that I think is really cool that we're working on these days is a, uh, um, basically, it's an interactive graphic novel approach. So where we're using, um, we're doing bra branching exercises off of graphic novel to help um, the learners in uh, trainings, these are real world type of training, uh, get into uh, what, get into the place of the characters. And it also allows you to um, get away from some of the, um, not just implicit bias, but also some of the, um, yeah, some of the implicit bias that happens when you do video training, right? Video branching exercises. So you can use a gra graphic novel can be a little bit more um, androgynous and generic and, um, and take it away from who's the person and more into what's the experience. Uh, so just a thought. So Luke had a question, what are you hearing about micro internships? Companies like Forge or Parker Dewey, um, are these companies helping with the supply issue of these important learning experiences? But actually I would just like to ask the broader question before you talk about companies. Is anyone here having have any experience with micro internships? The state of Kansas launched an initiative to promote micro internships. Um, I can't remember if it was before the pandemic or in the middle of it. Do you all feel like you're in a time warp too? Um, <laughs> so I, I don't remember exactly when, but sometime in the last couple of years, um, they've really been pushing micro internships. So we have a platform that employers and students can join and uh, be linked with different opportunities. We find it, um, it's almost like a, a gig economy for internships, right? So, cause yeah, they're I mean, very short term a, things. What is a micro? I mean, can you can you describe a micro internship and what is it compared to a um, other sure. type of internship? <laughs> yeah, I'd say they're more project based. So it's typically like a company who has this one project that they're needing some help with. Um, but it's something that a student could very easily do with little oversight. 
so they put it out on a job board and then students with those applicable skills can apply. So where I've seen it be very successful is in like a marketing field. So if someone is needing help with designing a website or maybe a chat bot, um, they can send that out there and their students who have those skills can sign up, do that one thing, and then they can put that on their resume that they've done this thing. They have something tangible they can show employers and that employer partner was able to get that thing done um, without hiring out, you know, a consultant or a, a professional service. Awesome. Um, and one, one last, I actually have, there's a question in q and I'll get to in a moment, but uh, Shelly asked, what about students who graduated and didn't have the opportunity for things like internships? Are there any programs out there for them? Does anyone know of anything? You know, in those instances, I think, and Jessica um, alluded to this too, I think it's important for students to know how to sell themselves. So how do you set up your LinkedIn profile? How do you create your resume and your cover letter so that you can best um, sell what you have to offer the company? An internship or an earn and learn is great. It's an amazing experience, but students shouldn't think that just because they didn't get to do that, that they don't have the skills necessary to be successful in their career. So what, pro what projects did you do in your classes? And how can you explain that to an employer in a way that makes it, that showcases what you are capable of. Excellent, yeah. Um, may I say something, add that, something to that? Yes. Um, I was, so for students that didn't get the chance to experience, you know, those cool opportunities or things in their classes or any cool projects, I know, um, as far as I'm concerned, when last I heard when I graduated, Georgia State all supports their graduated students um, definitely, I want to say a year after they graduate, um, as far as like utilizing career services, using, you know, Handshake, um, different platforms to help excel them in their career, you know, resume review, LinkedIn workshops, any workshops available to our, you know, currently enrolled students, Georgia State does support our graduated alumni, you know, students as well, until they feel comfortable enough to, you know, be on their feet, to go for this opportunity. So as far as, you know, the ones that didn't get to experience X, Y, and Z because of COVID, because of the pandemic, you know, not a lot of open, in-person, whatever the case may be, opportunities, I think schools should also reflect on you know whether or not they do have their your their resources still accessible to their freshly graduated and not just you know leaving them feeling like okay here's your degree goodbye I hope you had fun um, so it's like as universities and institutions what can we do also to make sure that even though you are not you know taking a class right now we gave you a degree but we, we wanna make sure you are set up for success because college is more than just your piece of paper that you get mailed to you. What, what also did we do because we are here to set you up for success? How can we ensure that we actually did what we want to do or what we intended to do? So honestly, different programs like that, utilizing those resources, having them available to students, even though they graduated, I think that will be a game changer for a lot of a lot of students that often feel lost once they walk that stage. That's great. Okay, um, we're gonna, um, just uh, before we move on to our next question, I just wanna um, respond. Um, Ryan Faulkner re referenced an article in Inside Higher Ed from yesterday that said that high flex is not the future. And Kelvin, I would like you to speak to, you know, what are your thoughts about high flex and its role in the future of digital learning um, as a, long-time leader in distributed learning and virtual learning. What's your thought? Yeah, uh, I've, I've skimmed the article. Um, I, I think my, my initial question and in response to the question is, you know, well, what's high flex, right? Uh, I think a lot of folks say high flex to mean a lot of different kinds of things as, as designed, as intended uh, by Brian Beatty, you know, years ago, it's an extremely uh, intentionally designed approach that requires a lot of work. We talked before about intentional design, student-centeredness, and it's both of those things when it's really carried out that way. Yeah. Do I think it's been carried out that way over the last couple of years? Uh, probably not. I think in practice, um, 
forgive me, but I think in practice, what it often means is there's an instructor in a classroom. There might or might not have been students in those inside the four walls and a door. And there was a, a camera and a, a synchronous video platform. Figure it out. And that's overwhelming and um, frankly, potentially dehumanizing. It's all, it's the antithesis of pretty much everything we've been talking about. Yeah. So if we just think that we can just put a, a webcam in a classroom and call it the future, well, yeah, yeah, I don't think that's that's a very good future. It's it's dystopian at best. So we can do better than that, right? Intentional design, you know, intentionality, student-centeredness, real high flex, maybe, but it's a lot of work to do that well. Yeah. That's good. Okay. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's you really have to design that. You have to design your interactions as an instructor. You can't just put on the camera, lecture. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know, it's like throwing a bunch of buckshot out there, <laughs> just hoping it hits the wall or something, you know. But anyway, um, okay. So my um, what do you think, what do institutions need to do in order to ensure that students and faculty and support team are successful in this new environment. And um, Je Jessica, we'll start from you. I haven't heard from you in a little bit. I think we have to start by defining successful. I think that's one thing that even Kiara pointed out in her last comment is, you know, I think universities would define success maybe as graduation rates, right? She's defining success as do I have a job after I graduate? You know, and I think a lot of students feel that same way. And so I think that you know, when it comes to what faculty want, what students want, what institutional leaders want, you know, everyone has different metrics of success. And so I think um, we have to think about what that looks like. I think um, another thing that of course is gonna be critical is tr training, professional development. Um, I think that we're asking a lot from faculty right now, um, a whole lot. And I think that they need a lot more support than we're giving them. Um, and I think that support needs to come in a lot of different ways, but one of course is professional development. Um, I think there needs to you know, be some mental health support, right? Like that's something that we're not having enough conversations around mental health support for both students, but faculty too. Um, I think technology support, I think we're making a lot of assumptions around you know, what faculty do and don't know or can and can't do. Um, and, and assuming that everyone's kind of coming in with, the, with some type of a knowledge base and we may be wrong. The same is true for students. Um, and, and I think, you know, just general like student, student services support, right? Um, a lot of times faculty are at the front line. Um, they're the ones that the students go to, not just for grades, right? Not just for the, the content, but that's who they go to a lot of times when their grandma passed away or when, you know, like all, all of these other things that we know faculty are having to try to juggle and figure out. And so, um, yeah, I just, I just think that professional development, but also just that support is something that is going to be necessary going forward. Yeah, good, good. Uh, Jennifer, anything to add there? Yeah, I would add and um, kind of pick up some of the comments that are happening here in the chat about faculty development and intentional design are more important than an outfitted classroom. You can put all the technology that you want in a classroom, but if your faculty don't know how to use it and they're not comfortable with it, then it's just technology that in three to five years is obsolete and you have to replace. So um, we've spent the last year and a half intentionally curating professional development for our faculty to help them be more successful in this new normal that we're experiencing, right, we, right. Ask, we asked them, what do you need? How can we help you be more successful? Um, and so we've created professional development around that. We have in invested in some technology as well to help them do that. We also have an amazing team of instructional technologists that that is their job is to support our faculty as they are using the new technology or implementing new learning design into their classrooms. So um, supporting them through that. And of course, um, to Jessica's point, recognizing that this is taxing and draining on them as well. And when we need to providing some um, mental health resources for them too, um, encouraging them to take time off. 
um, at, at all of those things that, that they need to do so that they can be there for their students 100%. That's great. That is, that is so great. We found, um, you know, in a, again, we, we support, you know, 55, 60 institutions, and we found that most of them spend most of their CARES money on hardware <laughs> and on technology, and they didn't spend it on their faculty. You know, and now they're coming and saying, oh my gosh. And the other problem is that a lot of the um, faculty development are like, okay, come to this workshop. And the problem is that that doesn't really, well, first off, there's, there's a lot of research that shows that a, attending a workshop is maybe not the most successful way to inculcate learning, you know, and, um, and to, 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 for long-term learning and deep understanding and learning. So, um, so, you know, the idea of supporting faculty in the journey and thinking about delivering learning as a journey and thinking about the way faculty behave. I cited a study earlier that where I, of about 500 faculty, we asked them how they spend their time in preparing for designing and developing their course. And the answer was that for the first time they teach a course, they spend about 50 hours pre-semester on the course. And thereafter, they spend about 23 hours pre-semester. But here's the most interesting thing. They spend eight hours a week mid in term working on adjusting, tweaking, iterating the course. So what we've done is we've rethought our whole thing and we really think about what we do as supporting faculty and not for that those eight hours and trying to make them more effective and have them use less time on that and more time on engaging with students. And if you think about it that way, it's an interesting way of thinking. So uh, Calvin, before we get off this question, is there anything um, you have to add to um, what was been brought up here? I'll pile on, um, sure. So I think to be successful, right? This was kind of the question, to be successful. I think institutions, we need to foster being human. <laughs> being human, treating other people as human. Uh, you know, it, it, it occurs to me that back in what, March, April, May of 2020, we heard words a lot like compassion and empathy. Those were the watchwords, right? And we just can't tire, we're tired of a lot of things, but we can't tire of compassion and empathy now. So individually, personally, and, and in our kind of our networks, our collective work, you got to cultivate kind of a I guess a growth mindset and we've got to stay in dialogue with each other. We can't just kind of see ourselves as just little individuals doing our thing and othering the other person or the other group. Right. We've got a, all those various roles, right? The faculty, the students, support personnel, administrative leaders, instructional designers. We've got to be in dialogue with each other so that we don't just see things from our little narrow view. And, and again, to just pile on, right, that that faculty preparation within that kind of a vibe. That's the, that's the kind of vibe we need, like that kind of faculty preparation and team-based design. Be human. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Shelly says more community practices for faculty professional development, really more, more thinking through. I, you know, Heather brought up a comment here, and I think this applies to a lot of what we're talking about here. One of the things I see in education is there's oftentimes no common definition of the words we throw around, right? And so kind of bringing, defining the words that seem to have various varied meanings and less reliance on assumptions is what Heather is bringing up in her comment. And I think that is a very, very good comment for everything we're talking about today. Um, so Kevin, Calvin, you're getting a bunch of uh, agreements on empathy, stamina for empathy. We use an exercise we call the empathy map and we use it frequently. We speak about it in all of our webinars many times. I'm actually going to be speaking about it after this in a live conference meet, a session. And um, it's just really thinking about what do students hear, do, say, see, and think when they're in your class? And what do you want them to hear, do, say, think, and see when they're in your class? Because oftentimes it's different, right? And then what are their emotional needs? What are their physical needs? Um, and what are their intellectual needs? And really putting your, grounding yourself in the student is a really great way to start your day, your week, your semester. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna, the next question is gonna be kind of a wrap up question. 
Um, and by the way, and, and keep Q&A coming. We got 10 more minutes here. So um, what are your aspirations for institutions, learners, and leaders in the future? And uh, Kara, we'll start with you because let's start from the student. Let's start with some empathy here. <laughs> Honestly, I think my the main thing that I personally would want to see in the future is more human relational skills. I want to see people step out of the business and the 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 productivity mindset and realize that we can't be productive if we are not right like within our own person. So it's like words like empathy and compassion we hear about it a lot but what are we actually doing to foster that because if a not even just a student if a person doesn't feel supported and encouraged and you know just appreciated or anything of that nature that productivity that burnt out is going to just go crazy so focusing on more of the human aspects of life and not the productivity not the business not that I think we will be better all around, you know, as leaders, as learners, as students, if we do just focus more on the human part of life. That's great. Awesome. Um, who else? Um, who else has something to add to that? Jennifer, got something? Kind of a parting aspiration for learners? and leaders and institutions and faculty? Yeah, you know, I think we just all need to work together for whatever the common goal is for your, your local area, right? Um, you know, we can't be successful at WSU Tech if our area employers and um, students don't find what we are doing to be beneficial. Um, so I think it's just being willing to listen and hear what other people are wanting and needing from your service um, rather than thinking you know the answer already. That's great. Carrie, I, I just wanted to, to dovetail on a point that Kira made early and Jennifer just made and, and Kira talked about students need to be trained on how to use some of these tools that are out there. And, and you know, we at Biblio, we make a tool, we have a product team, we have engineers uh, and, and uh, at the University of Phoenix, they, they told us we have adult learners that need to hear the, the book read to them or want the book read to them from the beginning of a chapter. We'd never thought of this. We'd never conceived of this because we probably didn't ask the question, do you guys think your students are consuming the content the way that it's intended? So we now have, a, we now have people that go to chapter three, hit play, and they're doing, they're multitasking, making dinner, doing their dishes, laundry, talking to their, their students, their kids. And uh, it, it goes to the point of listening to, you know, who you work with, whether it's you as educators within the WCET community or us as, as creators of these tools as well. So it's a great thing that Kira mentioned that I thought, boy, it's a lesson learned for us to make no assumptions about how our products and platforms are consumed and used. I think that's very true. And I think also um, not to ring the faculty bell over and over and over again, but it's true of faculty as well. <laughs> like they need help in understanding how they can best use the technology and how it can benefit their students. Um, so um, Kelvin, do you have anything to add to this question about your aspirations? Yeah, everything that's been said is so good. Um, I guess the only slightly different tack I might offer is, is a different kind of openness. Openness is my word, a different kind of openness. Maybe if we can kind of look backwards to kind of what got us here in terms of our successful past and look for core principles that are more timeless, um, like student-centeredness, like faculty preparation, like empathy, yeah. like be human, uh, and then still be open to the opportunities that have emerged during this crisis time, right? So we don't just try to look back and go, oh, we need to get back to that. And we don't just say, oh, we just materialized here with no past. Let's do more remote learning for forever. But instead we look back or influenced by the what's going on. And then we, we seize an opportunity that that's, that's a kind of openness, but that means being open, not just to 
ourselves and our own thinking, but open to each other and our perspectives as well. Wow, that's that's it, man. <laughs> uh, Jessica, do you have something to add here? Yeah, my highest aspiration, I guess, for higher ed would be that we, one, stop blaming students, right, for the inequities that we see. I think that we identify, you know, what structural inequities are built into our systems and policies and practices, and that we disrupt them. Yeah. And repeat over and over and over again. I think that blaming students is so critical. You know, I mean, so many times um, students come in feeling like they're blamed for any failure that they have when the whole system is set up to promote failure really is to weed people out and not to um, not to um, bring them to mastery right of outcomes you know and um, it's, it's such a important um, such an important way to reframe and uh, it's a much bigger question than than <laughs> <laughs> we can't talk about in the last three minutes, but uh, um, I wanted to come back to um, one of the quick conversations that was on in chat here. Um, and just as we're leaving, I just wanted to come back. Uh, Ling Thompson asked about how do you motivate faculty to become into faculty development? And there were some really good comments. And um, I think, you know, one of the things um, that uh, Luke said is, you know, we're offering less and more focused trainings and options and explaining the why and how it benefits faculty. So one of the things um, that came up in the meeting I was at today, an earlier meeting today was um, an academic leader was saying, you know, by even just offering a personalized note to invite a faculty, I think you'd be interested in attending this because, and or, I think you could contribute as well as learn in this because is a great way to get faculty to participate. The other thing we found is that looking at it more as um, support and making our virtual team available to, and that's what we do in, in our, some of our services, making them available so that it's anytime, anywhere, um, and um, faculty can use you in context when they need you is a really important thing. So are there any parting comments or questions? I think we're getting to the end here. No? Nope. Okay. Well, Megan, should I turn it back to you? Sure, thank you. What a great conversation. So you can see contact information there for our friends and we will be sharing this deck out. So you'll be able to click on those links to follow everyone listed there. And just a few housekeeping notes and uh, announcements of upcoming events and programs here at WCET. If you're new to us, check out our website. In fact, we launched a brand new website in the fall. So we hope you have a chance to get in there and check out everything that we have to offer for members. And as well as tons and tons of content that's free and open to everybody. Again, the webcast was recorded and we'll share that link out with you. And we'll also, there was, such good conversation in the chat. We'll kind of clean that up and share that back out. And I wanted to make a, a quick plug for our Elements of Quality Summit coming up April 6th. And this is for WCET members. And I will say that the program will be announced shortly, but it's going to be fantastic. You won't want to miss it. And finally, I want to thank our WCET annual sponsors and our supporting members. They help underwrite much of our programming and event here at WCET, and we are grateful for them. And we're grateful for all of you for being part of this conversation. And thank you so much to our speakers today and Carrie for leading the conversation. Hope everyone has a great rest of the week and take care and be well. Bye now. <laughs>